Hi, hello, uh, welcome to my channel. I'm Mandy Grace, author of 10 young adult novels so far, eight of which I am rewriting this year. Welcome to vlog seven of that adventure. We are in the midst of book two not super far along in it necessarily except kind of because in the new document I'm a few chapters in but in the corresponding original book I am more chapters in because I've been cutting a lot of the early chapters so yeah I, I don't know I don't really know how that shakes out but anyway the point is we're writing book two in a Robin Hood series and it's going well. Hi. So, random thought I was thinking about uh, just now, uh, because on my Instagram post about Always in Shadow, here, let me set you up there. Can you see me? Um, on my Instagram post about Always in Shadow, um, my, uh, I don't even know how to describe her, fearless leader, Anya, the hedgy mama of the writing group of hedgies that I'm a part of, wonderful woman that she is. Um, she <laughs> commented on my post, um, that she's, uh, interested to see, I don't even remember it, let me just read it because I can't say it. <laughs> oh, I knew what I was trying to say when I turned on the camera, but here we are. When I read it one day, I'll be looking forward to seeing how, as a nine, in what ways he finally drives the story rather than feeling swept up in it all. That's what she said. Um, and it was making me think about this because, uh, as a nine, as soon as, as soon as the Enneagram coach that I, um, bother, um, <laughs> pointed me towards type nine for much, at first I was like, how could I have not have seen that I'm a nine? Um, and then I was like, you know what? He really is a nine. He really is. Um, at which point it became easy to see how he would grow into himself, grow in confidence, learn to use his voice, speak his opinions, like all that stuff, because I've been on that journey myself. Um, but what I was thinking about just now when she messaged that, um, or commented it, whatever, um, was that when I originally wrote Always in Shadow back in 2015, so I was math 20. I was 20? Wow, that's just sad. Anyway, I was 20 when I wrote Always in Shadow. No, well, that's when I published it, so I was probably like 19 when I wrote it. Anyway, that's not relative. Point being, when I wrote it, I was not the confident, more assertive version of myself. I say more assertive. I'm not an assertive person, but like, relatively. Um, <laughs> when I wrote Always in Shadow, I truly believe the reason his story did not come across the way that I intended is because... I hadn't gone through it yet myself. Like, I I didn't know how nines, not that I knew he was a nine, but I didn't know how nines became the best version of themselves because I hadn't. I don't know why I was thinking about that, um, but I, that's what I was thinking about. I don't know what I'm saying, you guys, but anyway, when I wrote Always in Shadow, his story really doesn't come across the way I wanted to because he doesn't learn and grow. He doesn't come out from under the shadow of Always in Shadow which I wanted him to. So I'm really excited now to write it because I understand his story better having lived it. And I think I will be able to pull him through this, like, my opinions don't matter, no one cares what I'm saying, into the like, no, I have value to add here. Listen up, folks. <laughs> Uh, anyway, I was just thinking about that, and so I pulled out the camera so I could say it before I forgot it. So there you go. About to jump on a prickle. I think I just heard my water stop, so I'm gonna make my tea, hop on a prickle, write some words. We're at 11,000 words. We're at chapter four. I mean, I've only written, like, chapter four, the header. We aren't in chapter four, but we're starting chapter four. That's what I'm saying. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna get into that. Okay, I have written about 2,000 words. Um... I have been doing some back and forth between writing words and doing research on Sicily because I don't have any details or description, imagine that, um, in the original story about the surroundings of our little crew as they um, <sighs> embark on their first adventure of rescuing Princess Joan. So, yeah. 
I wanted to add some descriptions, but then I was like, I don't even know what the flora and fauna looks like in Sicily. And then I was like, you know, just looking at photos online, but then that made me see how beautiful the water is. And then I was just like, oh my goodness, so many things to describe. I don't even know where to begin. Um, so anyway, I was jumping back and forth um, between my document and just like Googling, you know, plant life, I guess. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I've written over 2,000 words. I haven't finished the Rescuing Joan section. Um, I would like to finish it today so that I can finish the chapter because I've been trying to do a chapter every time I sit down and write. I'm, I'm not sure, I mean, originally what I meant by that was getting through a chapter in the original document so that I was getting through all 34 of the chapters plus the epilogue and prologue in the amount of time that I'd made for myself. But... Once I started writing, the one chapter day started meaning a chapter in the new document, uh, which I don't, I don't know what that does to change my math, considering I'm on chapter six in the original document and chapter four in the new one. So whatever, either way, I'm, I'm making progress. So medieval times, it's, um, kind of historical fiction because I do, I do try to keep, um, like, the events that were actually happening during that time. Like, right now my characters are on the Third Crusade, which was a thing that actually happened. Um, and I try to keep, like, the, the route of the Crusade and, like, the battles they fought and everything, like, historical. Um, but also, it's a little wishy-washy, because it's medieval and, like, it just, it's fun to just play. So, um, <laughs> I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say I write, like, strictly historical fiction, but it's, like, kind of historical fiction. I know. I don't love it. <laughs> it's, it's just 6 a.m. right now. It's not awful. Well, I'm planning on republishing them, um, one at a time from August until December this year. Hopefully it, it works. <laughs> There are five Robin Hood books that I'm rewriting, and then there's a dystopian trilogy that I also would like to get to. So there's eight books that I'm going through. <laughs> it's a lot. It's going well. Um, I hopped on Nicole's Pringle this morning, even though she wasn't there. What's up, babe? He's taking a nap. Um, and I had to hop off, like, in the middle of a scene where my main character is, like, drowning at sea so I'm gonna jump back into that scene and save him before he dies because he's been thrashing around in the water for hours now <laughs> okay I feel awful but here we are my physical sickness aside on Monday we added over 6,000 words to the document um, we've moved into the stage where like maybe half of it is new words and half of it is being pulled from the other book so it's a bit of both, but it was um, like 6,500 words that I added on Monday. Monday was a good writing day. Yesterday, Tuesday, wrote absolutely nothing. I felt awful, but it's fine. Um, so yeah, we're still on schedule, even though I didn't write yesterday. I have Siamese twins. <laughs> Should I snap it or just use both? It's... uh. It's quite fascinating to jump between the books. So in Always in Shadow, the book that I'm actually rewriting right now, there's a scene that goes something like this. Robin, what's that much asked? What? That much pointed to the horizon. Robin squinted and raised his hand over his eyes to block out the sunlight. I do not know. It appears to be an army? Much gasp. What? I must inform the king. Robin strode forward quickly to the king's side. It was indeed Saladin's army, and within a few days the two armies met each other near the city of Arsuf and engaged in battle. At the end of a single day of fighting, Saladin withdrew, having taken a great beating from the Christian soldiers. The king and his army continued onward and took Jaffa, setting up headquarters there. <laughs> it's lovely, it's lovely. Um, and then we move over <laughs> to the tragedy of the traitor, which is Alan's book. And we have the same sort of dialogue with the like, what's that, whatever. There's a bit more description, like, <clears throat> it was late in the day and the sun was sinking low into the western sky to the right, its reflection shimmering off the distant Mediterranean Sea. I kind of like that, to be honest. I think I might keep it. But anyway, um, yeah, then we have the dialogue, we're like, what's that, it's an army, and then we talk to the king. And then, 
<clears throat> because this is from Alan's perspective. Uh, Alan fingered his bow as they grew ever closer to the army and to the city of Arzuf. He didn't relish the thought of another fight, more killing. They marched all night and into the next day before they came upon Saladin's army. The king gave the command, and Alan, Robin, and many of the other archers moved forward to let fly their arrows. The Saracens in front of them dropped by the th hundreds, I was about to say thousands, <laughs> yet they continued to press forward, and it was soon necessary to discard bows in favor of swords. Despite their best efforts, the Saracens made no headway. They were outnumbered by a great deal, and after a few hundred more were slaughtered, they were Treated. Alan glanced down at his sword dripping with blood and shuddered. Those bodies around him. They were someone's flory, someone's eerie, someone's Duncan. That's important because those are people in his past. Alan clenched his teeth, shutting out the thoughts. What good would it do to dwell on it? They were dead now, and that was that. <sighs> both of them, both of them, both Always in Shadow and the Shadow Trader, need some help, and like the entire battle is just glossed over. But. It's fascinating that it always in shadow was like, and there was a battle and we're done. And then in the tragedy of the traitor, like I really dived into a little bit at least. Maybe I wasn't diving. I dipped my toe into like Alan's internal response to what was happening and like his actual story. <laughs> Much doesn't have a story, okay? The original Much d doesn't have a story, but we're giving him one. Much doesn't really do a whole lot in a lot of the early scenes. Like, he, the Robin and this other character, Alan, like, um, facilitate most of the conversation. And then, like, the war stuff is just kind of, like, happening around him. And at first I was like, I need to give this poor kid some agency. And then I was thinking about it today, and I was like, you know what? Actually not, because we're still early in the book when he's supposed to be, like not do it. He doesn't think he can add value to anything. His opinions don't matter, whatever. So it's actually, I think it works really well that he's just sitting there watching everything happen right now. And then at some point after his midpoint, I'll start giving him more agency. I don't know why that switch like happened in my head, but I was very excited when it did. And I was like, ah, this works. <laughs> I need all the thoughts I can get for much because this book is like, there's so little there. <laughs> He's been, his book has been much harder than uh, Lucy's Legend so far. Um, I think it's because, this is just me spitballing, um, but I think it's because with Lucy's Legend, um, the story followed a very familiar story because it was just the legend of Robin Hood. So I, um, I mean, I have some original characters, but for the most part, I was just like shaping another legend of Robin Hood. And then, uh, with Much's story, it was the first one in the series where I was diving into, like, original story arc stuff. Because, like, with the later books, um, I have, uh, books three and books four open while I'm writing book two right now. Because they're all on the Crusades together, and I'm, like, reading all the different scenes to see what's relevant to Much. Um, and the scenes in book three and book four incorporate the internal, like, emotions and reactions and, like, everything with, um, the main characters of those books, and much of the story just doesn't. So I think it was just because it was my first, like, foray into that kind of writing, you know? Uh, after that prequel, we added about 2,000 words to the story, um, fleshing out Ugh, so, you know, dead battery strikes again, but we don't have to wait three hours to film again because my brother very kindly got me more batteries. Anyway, what I was saying was, um, yeah, we fleshed out the, uh, battle scene a bit. Um, it still feels a little bit glossed over, but also the, there's a lot of fighting in the Crusades, and I, how many of these battles do I really need to dive into on a detailed level? Also, do I need to dive into any of them except the ones that Much participates in? Because, you know, fighting for the peacekeeper self that he is is not, not fun. Um, but for the most part so far, he's been staying by the King's side because he and Robin Hood were promoted to the King's Guard, and the King has not been in the thick of the fighting. So Much hasn't been doing a whole lot, so we're basically just wa watching from afar, which I don't I feel like we need a lot of that. Uh, but anyway, um, we're about to get to a scene where Princess Joan and um, the king's wife show up. And in the original story, uh, Princess Joan has the biggest crush on Robin Hood, um, and it's just constantly, <laughs> it's just constantly um, flirting with him, basically. And he doesn't really 
care. I mean, he kind of flirts with her because he's Robin and he's, he's flirty. But, um, yeah, he remains faithful to Marion, his love, back home in England the entire time. Um, which I think is going to have some sort of impression on much. I don't know what, but I feel like it's going to have some sort of impression on much. I don't know, you guys. <laughs> Yeah, the baby thinks I'm talking to her and not to the camera. Um, <laughs> Hi, I'm back. It's been like 10 minutes since I turned off the camera. Um, I have been intending to write this book including Much's love story. Because in the original version, um, his wife pops up in the very last chapter. And there she is and they get married happily ever after. Um, <laughs> it's terrible. Anyway, um... Yeah, so my intention from the beginning was to introduce her when we get home from the Crusades and just have her through all of the Sherwood adventures, right? She's not a part of the gang, but, like, she can be around Nottingham and they can bump into each other and have conversations and fall in love, right? Um, but it just dawned on me just now, sitting here eating my lunch, that I need to go comb through Return to Sherwood and Return to Grace, the sequel series to see what I may or may not have said about Mary and the Sherwood years and when Much and Mary met. Yeah. Because I'm not intending on rewriting Return to Sherwood and Return to Grace, so if I say anything definitive in those books, that's what I have to stick with. I don't know that I did say anything definitive, but I don't know that I didn't. So, um, at some point today, I'm just going to quickly pull up those documents and like control F Mary and then <laughs> read every scene that she is in just to see if I said anything about when she met much or how she met much or if she had anything to do with much prior to the very end of <laughs> the story. If I don't say anything, I'll go ahead with this whole, like, romance idea, and if I do say something, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't really want to introduce her in the epilogue and be like, oh yeah, and then he met this girl, and a few years later they married the end. So, like, if I say anything definitive, I will maybe just not bring in the love story at all, because I'm planning on ending this story, potentially, um, before... I end Lucy's Legend. So Lucy's Legend goes all the way to the very end of the Sherwood Adventures, The King Returns. Excuse me. Um, Robin gets married. Like, everything everything wraps up. We have neat little bows on all the things. But, because this is Much's story, and his climax is actually... Hold on. I'm flipping over my Save the Cat notebook. His finale climax is rescuing Robin Hood. That time he gets captured. Um, so his climax is kind of still in the middle of the chaos of the Sherwood Adventures, but that, like, that's the moment that he steps up and takes charge and suddenly has accepted that he has agency and can do things and he doesn't have to rely on Robin for everything. You know, like, that's his, that's his shining moment and that is the end. Um, and I was planning on having, like, what I wrote down in my notebook for the final image after that is, like, the king comes home, he marries Mary, etc., etc. Um, so... If I can't have the love story of Mary in it because of something I say in Return to Show or Return to Grace, we'll just nix the Mary's Mary part. You know, the final image can be the king returning, we know the Sherwood adventure is over, and then when you read the sequel series, you find out that Much met a girl and has a wife, but you just never get to see it. Because there's no, there's no reason to just tag it on to the end of his book if it's not relevant. Right? Right? I'm not crazy here. <laughs> But if I don't say anything, then I will have the love story. That's that's where we're at. Hi, hello. Um, recap of my week. <laughs> so I started getting sick Monday night, um, and was sick Tuesday, so I didn't write. Pushed through the sickness on Wednesday and got some words in. Uh, yesterday, being Thursday, did not write anything because I was feeling awful. Today is Friday, still kind of feeling awful. But I really want to write. I miss writing. I've skipped so many prickles this week because I was feeling awful, which is a valid reason to skip them, but it makes me sad inside. I can't talk very well, losing my voice, have a sore throat. Um, 
Also, if I talk for long periods of time, I end up having coughing fits, and it's a disaster. I actually have a bit of a headache right now. I should not probably be trying to be productive, but <laughs> I'm going to anyway. <laughs> anyway, all that is to say, whether or not I write today, today's adventures on the vlog will be the end of vlog vlog are we on? Seven, I think, for the rewrites. So, yeah. I'm currently, having not yet written today, about 25,000 words into book two in the Robin Hood series. I'm really enjoying it. Um, it's been interesting trying to balance how much of the history of the Crusades slash scenes from other characters' perspective of the Crusades um, to incorporate for much my main character, because... He doesn't do a whole lot in the original book, um, which I've already discussed why I think that will work. But anyway, he doesn't do a whole lot in the original book. Also, a lot of the things are just glossed over because that's how I wrote when I was a teenager. Uh, so that's, that's just what I did. I didn't, there were no details. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, a lot of things are written not from third person limited were not from much's perspective uh so i wrote a scene i think this week maybe it was last week all the days have bled together it must have been this week i think i started feeling sick after the i went to the 6 a.m thing and that was this week right i'm blaming the 6 a.m prickle i was feeling fine before then anyway <laughs> um what was i saying much yeah so i wrote a scene i think this week where um, we're at sea, there's a storm, people are going overboard, it's a whole big deal. But uh, when Much goes overboard, we don't follow Much. Much goes overboard and then we swap over to like Robin and the, the sailors on the ship and see what they're doing. And I, I was, it was jarring to be honest because I, in my head, thought that I had written these books from each main character's perspective. But what I had really done was written it from a more uh, omniscient narrator standpoint, which almost works because um, the stories are all told from a narrator. So old Lucy is telling the stories to her great granddaughter. So we have a narrator who knows all the things, but after we shift out of the present of old Lucy and into the story, it tends to stick with the perspective of the main character of said book. So I would like it to do that consistently. Okay, um... Going to eat some lunch. 